seven Democratic presidential hopefuls have their eyes set on tonight's debate stage in Los Angeles. Strict polling and donor requirement means tonight that event will host the fewest number of candidates to date. Those who did qualify are expected to talk about issues like health care and climate change and, of course, the president's impeachment. CBSN political contributor Linda Tran is joining us now from a Marina Del Rey ahead of tonight's debate. She's a Democratic strategist and she's a founding partner of 270 Strategies. Thank you so much for joining us. Look at that beautiful view. I know. Every time we go great. back there, I'm like, man, we got to, you know, it's terrible. What? It's a terrible assignment. Yes, we miss you here in New York, Linda. <laughs> okay, so what is the best strategy for the candidates when addressing impeachment? Because they're going to have to, and of course, some of the people that are running are senators. Yeah, I mean, I think that the things that we've already heard from a number of the folks that are in the field is where they should stay. We not we had no surprises yesterday. We knew that the road was headed this way and that President Trump was likely to be impeached. At this point, for those folks who are sitting senators who are going to have to be in their chairs six days a week for many hours a day when the Senate trial takes off, they need to be clear they're ready to serve their duty and to be impartial on this front. Hmm. Uh, so, Linda, one of the things that we've been talking about here is uh, the viability of, of these candidates as the entire nation is transfixed on what is happening uh, with this impeachment, or maybe not. Maybe there are people that are really uh, not focused on, all on, on what is happening with President Trump and the partisan divide that is uh, being felt right now in Washington. And at the heart of that uh, divide and at the heart of this impeachment, Vice President Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. Now, his name has been brought up multiple times throughout the impeachment inquiry. How does the impeachment vote impact him? What are you hearing from his campaign about uh, how he intends to respond to the allegations that have been made? Even as uh, recently as this week, the President of the United States, in that letter that he sent to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, uh, really went after uh, the Vice President, the former Vice President, and his son Hunter. I mean, there's no question that this topic will come up tonight. And Joe Biden, I think we've seen um, on the campaign trail, is obviously taking this somewhat personally. This is a direct attack on his son, on his family, and he's actually responded in public to questions from people in the crowd in a way that one would expect a father would do. That said, he has also taken the opportunity to really pivot to what his foreign policy vision would be. He's spent several weeks now talking about his international experience, talking about some of the strengths that he uniquely brings to the table as former vice president. And I would expect tonight when the topic comes up for him to say, yes, of course, I take it personally. I think this is a very solemn and important process that we're going through. But look, ultimately what it really points to is the need for us to have a very solid, um, proactive vision for our foreign policy that serves the interests of America, not the person sitting in the Oval Office. So now we've got this debate. We finally have sort of a smaller crop of people to pay attention to. So everyone doesn't have, you know, 30 seconds to get a zinger in before we move on. But it's the holiday season. People are trying to finish up their shopping. It's been impeachment, impeachment, impeachment for weeks on end. Um, are, are people just sort of exhausted when it comes to politics? And do you think they'll be paying attention? Well, I think it depends on where you are and what you're most concerned about in your household. I mean, let it not be forgotten that we've also received a really important decision on Obamacare this week. And as we've seen in previous cycles, health care continues to rank among the top, if not the most important issue that voters are concerned about. And so certainly people who are, who are tuning in today are going to want to hear from the candidates on that front. And people who are reading the news may see the headline impeached, and that's the top item. But they're also thinking about everything from health care to gun violence to immigration. And I don't think that you could necessarily say that um, people are entirely exhausted. But I also wouldn't be surprised if people are also looking at this juncture to pivot a little bit to some holiday enjoyment with their families and maybe pick this up again uh, in more depth in January. Mm -hmm. So, Linda, uh, of the remaining candidates that are still running uh, for office, it, it does sort of beg the question as to whether or not there is a path for people who are not polling highly right now, but that 
because of the partisan nature of our politics at the moment, uh, they may actually be able to thread that needle. And I'm thinking about folks like Senator Amy Klobuchar, who's from the Midwest, mm -hmm. uh, who has a record of winning in uh, fairly conservative uh, rate uh, against conservative candidates. Um, it, you know, she's polling at about three percent, I believe, yeah. right? Uh, and you know, the race has been all we've talked about is the former vice president. We've talked about Senator Sanders and, of course, Senator Warren and the fact that Pete Buttigieg is making some inroads, but I wonder if uh, there are you hearing from the Klobuchar folks that they believe that there's still a viable path for her. Well, no question that Klobuchar's team believes there's a viable path, and they are looking with laser eyes at Iowa in particular, where she's been pretty strong overall, uh, given the really large and dynamic field of candidates that we've had. But also we've seen that she, if, if you're probing, she's second or third choice among others as well who currently may have another favorite. So there's certainly the potential for her to uh, deliver a really strong showing in Iowa, which would then impact the narrative, give her some uh, wind at her back heading into some of the other early states and help her to raise the funds and resources that are needed to continue to campaign. So there's always the possibility. That said, you know, the front runners have remained the front runners for a, a great many months. And so far, we haven't seen any of the debates or any of the other conversations that have happened on the trail really shaking that up to any significant degree. And, you know, as you pointed out earlier, Anne Marie, people are starting to think about holiday shopping and those kinds of things. And I wouldn't be surprised if tonight's debate doesn't impact the dynamics either. Are, There's still some <coughs> the one percenters that are hanging on, though. Yeah. Right. Um, and I, I presume that they are still raising <laughs> enough money to hang on, to hang into the race. Because that's the other thing. I mean, but then you've the, got you got like, to have the money to stick around and let other people drop out so you it, can improve. And if you're a former New York City mayor, Mike Bloomberg, you can uh, spend a lot of money and jump up to 5 percent, uh, right leapfrogging some of those folks who are 1 or 2 or 3 percent. Yeah. So before we uh, pivoted over to you, we were talking to the strategist about Tulsi Gabbard. I want to get your take on her move. She's, I think she's like 1%. One per, in the she's polls, one right? of the she's 1%. She's still pretty low, but she managed to get herself in the conversation, at least today. And she's not on the debate stage. Yeah, I think... I think Tulsi Gabbard's move to vote present is a, a really risky one for mm -hmm. her. Clearly, I mean, I think she has tried to inject herself into the conversation with less than conventional ways, whether it's taking on Hillary Clinton or boycotting debates in advance of them, saying that she would not participate even if she qualified. So she is taking a very, very untraditional route to try and um, get to victory here. But I have to imagine that the Democratic voters, the base, the people who have been paying attention all along for these many months, are not going to like that present vote very much and not see it as particularly courageous at a moment when Democrats from Nancy Pelosi on down have really defined as um, soul searching, as really a, a critical juncture in our nation's history when you have to vote your conscience. And so I can't believe that that's going to ultimately play very well to the folks who are most likely to make it out to the polls. Mm. And uh, Linda, are you hearing from uh, the Warren camp uh, that they uh, feel as if, uh, given the mood of the country when it comes to the Democrats, uh, that a lot of people who are Democrats wanted to see President Trump impeached? Um, and yet there are those questions about some of the policies that she and Senator Sanders are proposing um, that for a lot of people you know, who support the impeachment of the president, who want to see a change uh, come to Washington, but they're not so sure that they want to get on board. I mean, when you ask Americans for rapid change of a lot of things, that can be somewhat disconcerting for right. a lot of people. You're asking them, you know, not only are you going through an impeachment process, uh, but you're saying, look, uh, the health care that you've known uh, for the entirety of your working life may be going uh, the other way. Um, is it just too much for some people to take in? Which, again, that's why I'm curious about these, these candidates who are not polling in the top three or four, if they find opportunities based on that to make some inroads. Well, I think it's really hard to be critical of Elizabeth Warren's message and her strategy thus far, uh, because it's it's frankly served her quite well in the Democratic primary. She's found her way at various points at the at the very tip top of the polls, and you can't say that about many others who have um, thrown their hat into the arena this go around. And so, I think it's just part of who she is. It's her brand. It's her um, her approach to the world to be as daring and as bold in her vision as possible, and that has steadily um, built 
built her a lot of support. I can't see her changing or shifting that at this juncture. Uh, that said, I mean, there are some, some things happening around the world that may make you, you think about whether or not voters, uh, once you make the pivot to the general election, would be prepared for such um, revolutionary kind of changes as she's proposing. Um, I'm thinking specifically of the recent election results in England, for example, in uh, Great Britain. And so uh, I think that uh, it is entirely reasonable to consider that independents might not be as enamored by um, these big shifts, these big changes that she's uh, put forward as uh, the Democratic base might be during the primary. But do you, However, but does she, I mean, but, once the general happens... Yeah, and, and I was going to say, Linda, but does she and, and Senator Sanders, and I know that they're two very distinct and unique candidates, uh, but some of the, the policies that they're proposing are very similar in nature. And I wonder, though, um, so, yes, Democrats are getting behind it. That's why their poll numbers are, are strong and have remained strong. But I'm curious what your analysis shows you of what you just said, those independent voters, those folks who may have voted for Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012, but then voted for Donald Trump, but now don't like what they see with the president. They're not happy with uh, uh, the, 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 you know, what's been happening with Ukraine and his allegations against the former vice president. But they can't get behind a Bernie Sanders or an Elizabeth Warren. And they then may say to themselves, you know, might as well stick with what we got because, mm. because this seems too far left for me. Mm. Yeah, I think when you dig into the numbers, the picture is just not entirely clear. So it's a tricky balance always, right? Because, of course, you want to appeal to the base. You want to appeal to those super fired up Democratic voters who would make you the nominee. Um, and then you get to the general election and you have to kind of broaden, you know, who you're speaking to, how you make them feel like what you're selling relates to what they need. And I, I don't think that we're... Um, we're there yet with those folks, and I also think that um, there there have been some differences in the last several cycles that we also need to factor in, which is about turnout and enthusiasm, and actually growing the pie when it comes to those folks who are further to the left. So certainly there is um, tremendous opportunity for people like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, should they be the nominee, to get those people really fired up and get them to turn out at numbers that they haven't in previous years. All right, Linda, thank you so much.